Good morning. <laughs> that was a great lead into this uh, series that Pastor Jason uh, kicked off last week and is going to continue for the rest of this month. Just this idea of, you know, where our strength comes from. It's good to remind ourselves that, especially sometimes it just seems like we run out of strength and we feel like we got to do it all. And it's good sometimes just to stop, to take a breath, and to remind ourselves that the strength we have comes from God. And God is glad to give us that strength. In fact, the section we're going to look at today, we're going to go back and look at John chapter 15. And that's it, the whole point of what Jesus says here. That I'm the, I'm the one and just stay connected to me and all of this was going to work out. But you know how it is in life. You know, you feel at times that, you know, you ought to be doing some things. How many, how many of you know that there's something you should be doing, but you're not doing it, not because you don't think it's a good idea or the right thing to do, you just don't really have the strength or the energy or the time. Anybody else out there? You know. Yeah, and, and you know, and you run into this, and there's this word that we have that we see sometimes. It's this word. And for some of you, when you see this word, it's a bad word, right? Some of you think about your parents at this moment, Right? Discipline, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, and some of you think about your military experience and the discipline that goes there. Some of you think about just the discipline of life. You know, you're not a morning person, but you got a morning job, and it's just like, uh, and you get there, you know, when you go to the office and you got those people that are just always perky all the time, you know, and you have to have like three cups of coffee before you can even have a smile on your face, you know, and it's just that kind of, uh, the discipline. But discipline is not a bad word. Actually, it's a good word. But, but for a lot of us, while we know it's a good word, it's this thing here. It's, it's something you're supposed to do, but you really don't want to do it. It's like, you know, I need to go to bed earlier. I know it's what I should do, but I really don't want to. And I need to know I need to get up earlier, because if I got up earlier, I could do all the stuff that I want to do before I go off to work or before I go off to school. But I really like staying in bed. Or how to eat less or eat healthier or exercise more or just exercise at all. And how to save more, I'm how to budget more wisely, how to, you know, spend less. And, and we go through all this stuff and we have all this stuff that kind of hangs over, all this stuff that's, that's good for us that we know we're supposed to do, but at times it's just so hard to do it. And all of us probably know somebody who, who we're acquainted with that's just really disciplined. You know, they're the person that always gets up early and they go out and jog and they jog like a mile and then they get back and they get ready to, and they got their kids at the bus stop and they're off to work and they come home and they're, hey neighbor, how you doing? And it just, you know, they, everything just is some discipline in life. And there's a part of you that just resonates with that, that, that you, you admire that, that you're, you kind of go, hey, I wish I was like that. And there's a part of you that just wishes you could strangle them, right? And what is it? What is it about this idea of the stuff we're supposed to do, but we don't always like to do it, and the value of it? We know how good it is, but what is it in this that, that sort of resists that? And where does that disconnect happen for us? Because for most of it's not about knowing what's right. It's just about following through. And, and for some of us, it's not just following through. It's the fact that we have somebody in our life who's telling us we ought to do this kind of thing, Right? Maybe you have a loving spouse who tells you over and 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 you just think, ah, I know, I know, but leave me alone. Or maybe it's your doctor who every time you see him says, you know, I've been telling you, you got to you know, less of this and more of that and none of that and this and, you know, it's going to be good for you. And there's just something in us. But today we're going to look at a story as Jesus, uh, one, of the, one of the last kind of statements that Jesus makes to this, this group of guys we call his disciples. These, these 12 at this moment, the, when the passion happened, actually the 11, because one of them has gone off. He's going he's gonna to sell Jesus out. He's going to set Jesus up so that Jesus gets arrested, ultimately gets tried, ultimately gets, gets killed. And so now he talks to this 11. It's one of the last things he says to them. And in the midst of that, we, we discover this idea of not just what's good for us, but 
how that actually ought to be working, that it's not just up to us. In fact, it's up to somebody else. So before we get there this morning, I want to invite you to bow your heads and let's pray uh, one more time together, right? Lord, sometimes we just need to be reminded that you are the source of our strength. That it really isn't up to us as much as we sometimes think it is or are told it is or feel the weight of it. And knowing that doesn't excuse us from, from following you, of making tough choices, of doing stuff that we're supposed to do even though we don't always feel like doing it. But I just know for myself, if I could just get this right, that even in the midst of all those doing those things, it still is not up to me. It's always been up to you. And it always will be up to you. That you are the source of our strength. And I just pray for those today that, that maybe, maybe aren't your followers, maybe wouldn't call themselves anything who might be in this room or watching online. That maybe today uh, something will flicker, something will kind of make them think, maybe I've been looking at this all wrong. And for some of us who've been around this thing we call faith and church for a long, long time, I pray for us as well that maybe, maybe you can remind us today that we've gotten it all wrong. That we need to get things in the right place and remind ourselves again that you are the source of our strength. And if you can help us get a little closer to that today, that will be a good, good thing. So, use this time now to move us in that direction for your sake and for your glory. Amen. Uh, if, you, if you were here last week, if you weren't here last week, uh, this whole series is based on John chapter 15, one little section of our Bibles. Uh, but it's an important section. And uh, so we're going to kind of cover, actually we're going to start in John the last verse of chapter 14, and remember, again in your Bible, you have chapters and verses, not because when the person wrote this, they, were, they put chapters and verses, he's put it so it's easier to find stuff, but, but this is just a flowing discussion. So chapter 14 is actually connected to chapter 15, it's just part of what happens. And chapter 14, the very last verse, before we get to John, chapter 15, verse 1 says this, get up, let's go. And the see, scene is, Jesus has just got done with what we refer to as the Last Supper, and it literally is the last time he eats a meal with these followers of his. And they've sat there, Judas has left the, the guy that ends up selling out Jesus, he's left the room, he's gone off to start this process, and Jesus know, seems to know what's going to take place, and, he, and as, he, as they finish there, he tells them, get up, let's go, and they all stand up, but it's almost like too much for Jesus before he can leave this room and go out to where they're going, he has to say one more thing to them because he knows what the next few minutes and hours look like for them. But before I tell you what he says next, I want to tell you what he concludes just 11 verses later as the reason he's going to say this to them. And here's what it says in John 15 verse 11. Guys, I have told you these things so that you can have the same joy that I have. The stuff we're going to look at today, Jesus says, I'm, I'm telling this stuff that you're going to hear in just a moment. Is this, I'm telling you so that you can have the same joy that I have, that, that my joy can be in you, and so that your joy will be the fullest possible. I'm going to tell you these things because I want your joy to be, be the same kind I have, and I want it to be full, and, and the word here literally is this idea of crammed full, and for us, maybe the best picture is Thanksgiving Day, after the meal, and after dessert, do you know how you feel at that moment? Kind of crammed full? That's what Jesus says. He wants that joy to be in your life. He wants that joy to be just like when you've decided you've had your one piece of pie, your two pieces of pie, and you've sat around and talked for 15, 20 minutes and decided that last little piece is calling your name. And you go, I don't think I can take any more. Jesus says, I'm going to tell you this stuff so that you don't think you can take any more of this joy. And here's what, he, here's what he says, that he says, I'm telling you this stuff will be for joy. 
And he, and he tells them this stuff because he knows what's going to take place, and he knows that they will be tempted after his death to go back to what was, and he wants them to stay in what is. He says, we have had, we've had an amazing, you know, time together. We have, we've grown together as friends. You know, you've not just been my followers, you've become my friends. And I want you to remember this because I know what's going to happen, that when I die, you're going to go, oh, mama, this is bad. And you're going to be tempted to go back to what was because we all in those moments of crisis tend to go back to the, our past experiences, how we were raised, what, what, what influenced our lives. Those are the places of comfort, even if they don't make sense to us, even if they're not the healthiest way to deal with stuff, it's where we go. And Jesus knows they're going to be tempted to go back to where, where they know. And he says, I, want, I don't want you to, I want you to stay right here where it's at. I'm going to stay in my joy. And here's what he describes as the things he tells them so they have joy. He says, I'm the true vine, so I'm the vine, I'm the, I'm the part that goes in the ground, I'm the part that gets the stuff out of the ground, I'm the main part. And by the way, my father, he's the gardener. And Jesus tried to teach these guys that, that his father, that God his father, is a good, good father. That when we know that he's the gardener, that's a good thing, that's not a bad thing. That's not that Mike's the gardener, because I have no idea about gardening. You ever, you ever see somebody who doesn't know anything about gardening try to, try to prune something? It is not a pretty sight, right? Because I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just trying to make it look good today. And a good gardener knows that he, his job or her job is not to make it look good today. It's to make it good for later. So Jesus says, I'm divine. Father's the gardener. And by the way, he's the one who cuts off. He takes away every branch of me that doesn't produce fruit. That makes sense. That the whole purpose of a vine. And he's talking here as he sits in this room before. He said, get up, guys. We're going. After just had this last supper. After they see the, the, the wine on the table, he's reminding them that that doesn't get there without a vine. And branches that don't produce end up dying. They get, they get taken away because the plant is all about producing. <clears throat> and he trims and cleans that is prunes every branch that will that produces fruit, so that it'll produce even more fruit. The whole purpose of a vine is to produce fruit, but a gardener tries to make it produce even more fruit. And by the way, this is my father that's doing it. <clears throat> then he says something. Remain that is abide in me, and I will remain that is abide in you. In fact, 11 times in 11 verses, Jesus will say that word, remain. Abide. Which simply means stay put everybody say stay put <clears throat> that's what you're supposed to do he says stay put in me i'm going to stay put in you this is all going to be good this is all going to work out just stay put don't forget that stay put don't look over there don't, you know over there. focus focus just stay put just stay connected <clears throat> stay in me and i'm going to stay in you a branch can't produce fruit by itself, but must remain, that is, abide in the vine. In the same way, you cannot produce fruit alone, but you must remain, abide in me. In fact, the verse goes on, it keeps coming back to this. Dead branches are dead, they wither, they die, they're thrown away. If you don't stay connected, you're going to be in trouble. Over and over, it keeps driving home this point, just stay put. In fact, you will put it this way. Without, that is, apart from me, they can do nothing. Which shouldn't surprise any of us, right? How many of you have, have trees around your house? You know, how many of you have trees? Any of you ever come home and you find like one of the branches has fallen off? Anybody find that? You know, you come home, I find that occasionally. Branches, the wind blows. What do you do with those branches? Anybody ever try to put the branch back on the tree? Right, you laugh because it's, it, it's, it's a dumb idea, right? You know, you can duct tape it back there. But normally by the time a branch falls off a tree, it's been dead for a long time. It's just finally going to its resting place. And so this whole idea of without me, you can do nothing. This is not a threat. This is just a, an actual statement that anything separated from the trunk, anything separated from the vine, dies. And so for the branch to think he can do anything without the rest is in trouble. In fact, the life of the vine is the life of the branch. And the life of the branch is not the life of the vine unless it's connected. Because a branch cut off from the vine can't survive, but the vine cut off from the branch, you know what happens to it? It's just going to kick out another branch. 
And Jesus says, that's why I need you to stay put. As long as you're connected to the life, as long as you're connected to the vine, it's going to be okay. In fact, if you don't remain in me, they're like a branch that is thrown away and then it dries up and withers and dries up. I mean, it goes on. In fact, it's one of those statements, just like you know, when somebody's been telling you over and over and over and over and over again the good things you need to do, but you don't do them because, and then they tell you, and you really don't want to do them because if you do them, it's going to be like you're listening to them and you don't want to listen to them, right? Jesus does that in this passage. Keep saying abide to me. Stay put. Stay put. I'll stay in you. Branch broken off. Not good. I'm going to die. Branch doesn't produce. I'm not, you're not good. You're going to die. And over and over, he keeps coming back to this. And he does it probably most likely the reason that keeps, the person keeps saying that in your life, not because they don't care about you, but because they do care so much about you. That they can't help themselves but to say, we need to do this. Stay put. He goes on and says, listen, if, if you remain, that is, you stay put in me, and, and my words remain, abide, that I stay put in you, that is, you follow my teachings, you can ask anything you want, it will be given to you, dead, done for you. There, he comes back to this idea of staying put, of, of staying connected, and he adds this idea of these words to that. He goes on and says, listen, you should produce much fruit and show that you are my followers, that is, my disciples. You should do it because that brings glory to my Father, who is the gardener. Any of you have obnoxious gardener friends? Anybody? If they're in the room, don't raise your hand. Just kind of go like this. I'll, I'll figure it out. But if it, do anybody have any obnoxious gardener friends? You know, they, they like to invite people over to their house. You know, they show you all the beautiful stuff. It looks like out of a, some magazine, and you just want to stomp on something when you leave, you know? Because it's just so perfect, and it's like everything they do, you know, you can't, you know, you can't, you can hardly grow anything, and they, everything looks beautiful. But, but, but the whole reason of it, you know, the gardener does it not just to bring glory to himself, but, but the fact that, that that production shows that things are working the way they should and that somebody knows what they're doing with it. And so when Jesus says, just stay, stay in me, stay there, and, and, and I want you to produce fruit, I want you to, to kick this stuff out, I want that all to happen, I need to ask you a deep theological question this morning. To all of you that are scholars in this room, stay on your toes. It's a hard question, all right? How hard does a branch have to strive to produce fruit? Anybody got an answer? I have an answer. I have no idea. I mean, a branch is just a branch. <clears throat> it's, it's part of something else. It's not like it's sitting there thinking, uh, oh, there's one. Uh, I mean, I don't think. We, don't, we know they don't have a brain. We know we don't have those kind of feelings. You don't break off a limb and it goes, ow. We, so the whole point, the, the picture kind of breaks down this idea of producing. When Jesus says, I want you to produce much fruit, that is not the job of the branch. That's the job of the gardener to get it prepped to do that. All you need to do is stay put, right? As long as you're connected to vine, all going to be good. It's when you break away, when you think you're going to, you know, kind of do something over here, that's when the trouble happens. In fact, so often, if you've been around church, you've maybe heard this passage, and the fruit becomes this idea of, you know, your production, that you're bringing somebody else to faith and all that stuff. That is not what Jesus is talking about. What Jesus is talking about is the one thing the Bible says he's talking about. In fact, Paul will write later that God's work, that our connection, that our staying put, the fruit that gets produced is this, that the Spirit produces the fruit of love, of joy, of peace, patience, of kindness, of goodness, of faithfulness, that is faith, of gentleness, and self-control. I want you to think about that. Have you ever ha tried to love somebody that you just had a hard time loving? You ever have somebody tell you, smile and be happy when you aren't smiling or being happy? Or somebody tells you, you need some peace at this moment, calm things down, have some patience, 
Normally when people tell you, be patient, be patient, you're thinking, I don't need patience, I just need this situation to stop at this moment, right? Or to be more kind, or be more gooder. I know gooder's not a word. If you're thinking of talking to me later and telling me, Mike, you've got to use better English, you made me know how to think about what it means to have fruits of the Spirit in your life. Just a thought. But I love the next one, faithfulness. <clears throat> Do you know that, your, that faith, just the faith that you have, however big or small or, or it seems like so fragile, however you see your faith, a really strong faith, do you know that's not even from you? That's a production of the Spirit in your life. The idea of gentleness. Or the idea of self control How many of you would like to be more in control of, of just you? you know, more in control of your emotions and your thoughts? And especially your words, you know? And the crazy thing is, this is stuff you cannot produce. In fact, it's not your job to produce. Your job is simply to stay put. Because if you stay put, the juice flows, the life from the vine goes to the life of the branches, and things happen. Back to our, our, our passage here. He says, guys, listen, I have loved you. I've loved you as the Father has loved me. And the Father has loved me by being just, he's loved me. Everything I do is because he's loved me, and, I, and, and he's done everything for me, and I've done everything for you. So, guys, I need to know that I've loved you just the same way he's loved me, and all I need you to do is to remain, that is, abide in my love. Just stay put in that place. Because stuff's going to happen that's going to make you go, whoa, that doesn't seem so loving. This doesn't seem so good. And he said, just, just stay here. I want you to know I, I'm, I'm there. I'm there, and I've been there. I have obeyed that has kept my Father's commands. And I've remained and abided in his love in the same way. If you obey that has kept my commands, you will remain and abide and rely in love. This is simply this idea that when you're in love, when somebody you're in your love relationship, you, you trust them. And because you trust them, you obey some things they do. They tell you to do. Have you ever been ri riding along the road? And you're, you're, the person you're with in a car, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your boyfriend, maybe it's your girlfriend, says stop. And you stop, not because you've seen anything, but because you've responded to that, right? Anybody ha have that great experience, right? Hopefully none of you have said, I'm not listening to them. You, you, you've obeyed, you've responded simply because you know there's something that's been built up that they love you, that they care about you, and they would not say those things. And you're not thinking about this stuff. You're simply saying, stop, I'm stopping. Oh, that was good because that would have been really, really bad. And when Jesus says, listen, but by following what I've told you to do, it's simply the reminder that I'm telling you this stuff because I love you. And I'm not going to ask you to do stuff that I wouldn't do because I want you to know I did the same thing for my father. I've kept my father's commands. I've done everything he's asked. Not to earn anything. I've already been loved by him. I'm simply, this is the way I live it out. It's the way I honor him. This is the way I stay connected and I stay put with him. And I've told you these things. So that you can have the same joy I have, the, the fullest possible. And here's the thing I think we, you need to know and what I need to know from this passage. That this is not about trying harder. The branch does not sit there thinking, I'm hooked to the vine, I just got to stay tight, hold on, hold on tight, hold on tight. Shh, 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 shh. Pretty branch over there. Oh no, shh, shh, you know, that's not the picture going on here, right? This is not about trying harder. In fact, this is it's about staying better. And when I say staying better, I don't mean, oh, look how good, I'm, I'm getting better and better. This is just staying better. You know, we need to learn to stay more than we need to learn to, to try. Because Jesus said, I'm divine, you're the branch. We are starting from a place of connection, not starting from a place of getting connected. It's not about trying harder. It is simply about staying better. That's actually good news. I don't know why they're crying, but that's, that's actually good news.
So here's the question. You know, how do you stay connected? How, how do I stay connected? How does this all work out? And if you've been around church very long, you've heard some of the things. Here's how you stay connected. Read your Bible. Say your prayers. Take your vitamins. I actually just threw that last one in. Yeah, yeah. I can't literally say that last one because I'm not a doctor. And, and I'm not, you know, saying that, that taking vitamins are going to help you health-wise. I can't do that, right? But, you, but you've heard these things, right? Read your Bible, say your prayers, take some vitamins, right? But here's the problem. If that's the way you stay connected, and that's the only way you stay connected, you were only connected for a few minutes out of your 24 hours. Now, those aren't bad things. I can't speak, it might have been one, again. But reading your Bible... Jesus did say if we remain in his word, and the only way you can remain in the word is knowing what that says, and, and saying your prayers, the idea of talking to God and having those moments when it's clear that you are direct, direct, there's nothing else going on. Those are important moments, and they're helpful to it all, but it's not the answer to how you stay connected. Because the branch doesn't stay connected in the morning, read a passage, prayed, and then it went off for the day, and later came back and got the divine. It's got to stay connected the whole day. So how do I stay connected? And I would simply this. I want you to write this down. You just need to trust the process. Trust the process, even when it seems like the process is going too slow, or maybe especially when it seems like the process is going too slow. Because Jesus said, if you remain, that is abide, that is stay put with me, I'm here all the time, right? I'm going to stay put with you. And how does the process work? <clears throat> Part of staying connected is places like this. You know, you come to a place like this, we have a chance not only to, <clears throat> to sing together, to, to sort of help you know, our minds and our hearts catch up through the week and somehow find some place for God. We, we have a chance to hear an incredible speaker week in and week out here. What are you laughing about? No. But you have a chance to, to hear something that hopefully makes some kind of impact, maybe gives you an idea about how to maybe live this whole thing out. You have a chance to pray together. You have a chance to see people that you know are in the same kind of things that you are. And there's something about energy of coming to a place where we know that people care about us, that, that we're all here about the same idea, uh, that we can get some strength. But that's not the only way you stay connected. You also stay connected to the people you choose to surround yourself with. You know that the people you choose to surround yourself with can, can have an impact on how connected you stay to God. And so the environment around you has, has an impact on that. And some things you can't prevent, but, but just to recognize, yeah, people I have in my life do have a chance either to kind of help connect me or kind of pull down on me. Personal discipline. It's that discipline word again, you know? And again, if you've been around a church very much, you know at times they talk about this, the idea of, you know, prayer and of reading God's word and studying it and all those kinds of things, and it's like, ugh. But here's the thing you need to know about those. It isn't always about what you get out in the moment. It's about what that moment gives you for your future. Because sometimes you've got to do stuff now, not because it's going to pay off now, but what it's going to do for you later. You do it in your savings, hopefully. You put a little bit away today, doesn't seem like much. Next year, seems like a little bit more. Next year, it just, that, 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 and you feel like I could use that money now, but putting it later, there's something about that. There's some of you that take a medication right now that you don't want to take, that you don't like taking, but if you don't take it, you might die. And so it's about how you feel at the moment. It doesn't make you feel great at the moment. You just know that if I don't, it's not a great ending. And so I'm going to do it simply because I need to do it. 
And what I say on this is the fact that, you know, sometimes you can listen to people, and, and, and I think there are people that works for them. I think that's great. But in general, I think for the vast majority of us, it isn't like every time I open up the Bible and I see a light, that I feel a warm, fuzzy feel, that I hear angels. And sometimes it's just I'm reading this and I'm trying to make some sense out of it, and I feel like that's all I've done is just read something. But sometimes that thing I read will pop up later. Normally not that day, maybe not even that week, maybe not even that month, but at some point something pops up and I go, oh, okay. And it's like praying. Sometimes it feels like there's a great connection with God, and other times it feels like I'm just saying the same stuff that I say all the time. But maybe there's value sometimes in saying, just doing the same stuff, being disciplined in that. Because it does open up the possibility for some kind of connection. You can also stay connected through pain and suffering. Remembering that pain and suffering is not the exception to the norm. It's actually, what's going on? I mean, that's why you ought to read your Bible, by the way. Because the Bible reminds you, a lot of people went through some tough stuff, and, and, and that's not to say, oh, God uses pain and suffering. I'm not making that kind of point. I'm just saying, that's sort of life, but in the midst of that life, sometimes I need to remind myself, where does my strength come from? If it's here, I'm in deep water. Water's the word. But I need to trust the one who is responsible for the process. Because when I trust him, that's the way to stay connected. Because he's told me, stay with me and I'm going to stay put with you. And the fruit is actually the effect of just staying connected, that he works those things in. And he makes me more loving. Puts a little more joy in my life. <clears throat> Gives me some peace. Helps me a little bit more patient. A little bit this week. Instead of being a kinder and gooder. That my faith grows. to become more gentle and then begin to get a more grip on my emotions and my thoughts and my mouth and that's all because not because of anything I've done it's simply because I've stayed connected and I've trusted the one who's responsible for the process see the reality is the way you stay connected is to bring God into the things that you're already doing it's not about saying you need to pray more, you need to read your Bible more. That may be true. Maybe you just need to do it at all. I don't know where you're at. But this is about bringing God. The only way to stay connected is you can't read your Bible 24 hours a day. You can't pray 24 hours a day. I mean, you can, but, but it's not a great look if you're closing your eyes all the time. But you can invite God into Tomorrow when you're watching your favorite team in football lose again. And on Monday when Myrtle is there in the next cubicle over and you're hearing about her weekend again and all the stupid stuff she did and how she's so upset about it and how this didn't go right. And, when you're on your commute going to work or coming home with your neighbor maybe your family but the way to stay connected is to bring God into everything because God wants to be connected to everything that goes on in your life see your greatest ability is your availability And that's what God, Jesus is talking about here. Staying connected. Staying available. 
and seeing what he might do in your life. See, when Jesus talks about he's the vine and you're the branches, he's not talking about a tree. He's talking about a grapevine. And if you're familiar with grapevines, you know, the, the, the branches start out, and they have these little things called tendrils, these little curly things that come out, and they hook onto stuff. And there they bring support. They're the, the thing that brings safety to the branch. I'm, I'm hooked to something, so I feel more safe and secure. And a gardener comes along, and a gardener will cut those things off, not because they're bad, not because he doesn't want the, the vine to have some support, but he, what he wants that vine to do is not be pulled down by stuff, but to keep rising up, to keep growing. And if you let it get hooked too low, too fast, that vine will never grow up. And what if? What if there's some things in your life that need to be cut off? And what if they need to be cut off not because they're bad, but simply because what they're holding you back from? And Jesus says, listen, if you stay connected to me, and we're a vine together, by the way, my father's the gardener. And he's going to do that stuff, and he's going to do it simply because he knows it'll give you the chance to produce more fruit, and the more fruit is simply that you get the chance to experience more love in your life, more joy, more peace, more patience, that whole list of stuff. So what would it look like? What would it look like this week if you were simply to focus on staying connected? That every moment that you had that chance to kind of disengage because you got cut off in traffic, because you know, have too much at the office and too much stuff to take care of, and everybody's asking stuff, you know, what would happen in the midst of that heated discussion you're having with your spouse that you caught yourself and said, what does it mean to stay at this moment? To simply abide, to remain, and let him remain in me. What might that do for your life? Because all of us need to decide where our strength comes from. And Jesus says, listen, with me it's clear my strength comes from my Father, and your strength comes from me because you're connected to me, and you need to stay connected to me. Trust the process. Because your job is simply to stay connected.